We're joined today by Rob Mercury, Republican candidate for the 17th Congressional District. Why are you seeking this office? Well, Francine, first of all, thanks so much for having me today. Um, you know, it's an honor for me to serve currently as the 28th District State Representative. And uh, I've announced my candidacy for the 17th Congressional District. You know, our party is, or our, our country is so divided right now. Um, we need legislators uh, in Congress who are uh, focused on governing, getting things done, finding common ground, and coming back home to the district and representing our people well. And so that's why I'm running. For the benefit of our statewide audience, what should our viewers know about the 17th Congressional District? The 17th District is a beautiful suburban and rural area. It includes all of Beaver County and the suburbs of Allegheny County. And uh, I'm from the North Hills side. It includes some on the South Hills, including Mount Lebanon, and Oakmont uh, in the north. Uh, so it's a beautiful district and it's really uh, emblematic, I think, of the Pittsburgh area. You attended the U.S. Military Academy at West Point and you served two, two tours of duty in Iraq as well. I did. Can you talk a little bit about how that experience has kind of brought you to where you are today and what you've brought, gotten from that? Yeah, so a lot of my leadership foundation is from West Point. And uh, I graduated in 2004. And so my sophomore year, 9 11 happened. And that changed the trajectory of myself and my classmates' uh, lives and careers in the military. Um, I did two tours, as you mentioned, overseas in Iraq, uh, one in 2005 and again in 2007 and 2008 uh, as a part of the surge. Uh, I'm proud of my service. Um, I came back with the Bronze Star. Uh, my team and I uh, did uh, intelligence work and training work uh, for the Iraqi battalions. Um, and all of uh, the American soldiers that deployed um, uh, have something to be proud of and, uh, and those who served. And actually, we just uh, passed the 21st anniversary, believe it or not, of the start of the Iraq War. Um, and looking back, um, there's much to think about. But I do know um, that the service rendered by myself and my classmates um, was honorable. And um, my class of 2004 lost 14 service members uh, in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, the most of any class since the Vietnam era. And so that timing of my service uh, was really um, uh, impactful in terms of uh, the trajectory of, of everybody's service. You know, when I was over in Iraq um, and looking back at the United States, uh, you realize what you have here, what we all uh, benefit from, which is uh, the most amazing country uh, ever created, uh, the best system, the most prosperous economy, and the strongest military of all time. And it's almost like, when the astronauts go up into outer space and they look back at, at the world and you see this beautiful uh, blue earth and realize, you know, from their perspective, um, how, how lucky they are uh, to be alive. And, you know, I feel that way about the United States. We're lucky to be American citizens. I treasure that. And I want to build a better future uh, for uh, our community, for my three kids, for their kids, um, and for all of us. You went on to a career in finance, and as you've already mentioned, you currently serve in the State House as well. Yes. What, how would that experience translate into serving in Congress? Well, there's a lot of translatable skills uh, from my time in finance. I worked for PNC Bank for seven years um, in the risk and finance uh, organizations, and I worked with Ernst & Young and PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, in New York and then in Pittsburgh a little bit as well, and really learned um, a lot of uh, uh, skills related to how the economy works, and I was in the back offices of, of many big banks uh, doing conversion work through the financial crisis. Um, so, you know, I was uh, in the military during 9-11, and then during the mortgage crisis of 08-09, uh, I was in the banking industry uh, working to uh, help big banks comply with new federal programs uh, like Dodd-Frank, um, and basically to shore up the financial system. So I learned a lot about how the economy works, how jobs are created, uh, and I take that with me uh, into the role that I now have um, in the State House in Pennsylvania. Uh, I've served, served on the Finance Committee and the Commerce Committee, uh, where we talk about legislation that will impact uh, business owners um, and uh, financial structures. My first bill, actually, that I got passed 
in the state legislature was a remote mortgage banking bill. Uh, coming out of COVID, we realized you could do more work remotely than ever before, uh, and it makes sense to, to kind of take those steps forward. And uh, so we passed uh, that bill, uh, and that was kind of leveraging some of the skills that I learned in the financial services industry. And then finally, as a small business owner myself, um, I know how to manage the books uh, and do that work uh, a little bit better from my time in finance. What are the most important lessons you've learned in serving as a state representative? Well, the uh, state of Pennsylvania is a fascinating place. Um, I grew up in uh, West Deer Township in Allegheny County, a uh, nice uh, rural area, um, and uh, had a wonderful upbringing. Um, and, uh, but you don't always get to the other parts of the state. And, and so, you know, being in a, a legislature where it's equal representation for every single one of us in Pennsylvania, 13 million people, um, is really fascinating. Um, and so it's, it's representatives from farming communities, representatives from Amish communities, uh, urban centers, uh, Philadelphia, um, Erie County, all over the state. And um, so you, you learn about the people of Pennsylvania, and it's a beautiful state, um, and there's so much good here uh, that it's really encouraging. And you also learn how this process works. So we're a, a state legislature of 203 representatives, 50 senators, and you've got to learn how to get along, and it takes a majority to pass, and you need any, any bill, and you need uh, both houses, uh, both chambers, to pass the bill. And then you need the governor. Um, and so it's, it's not easy to get things done, uh, but it was designed that way to be quite deliberative uh, and thoughtful. Um, and so, you know, in an age of, you know, kind of internet searches and um, immediacy, uh, there is something uh, refreshing about uh, the deliberative nature of, of the legislature. How would you characterize the economic environment in the 17th Congressional District? Well, I say we have some work to do. It's a very successful district, meaning there are lots of uh, job creators, great small businesses um, all over uh, the district and uh, many successful uh, communities. Uh, but I would say, too, that our uh, constituents are feeling the pinch. It's an inflationary economy. And, uh, you know, the overspending in Washington, the dysfunction in Washington um, has taken a toll, I, I think, on um, families across the district. And, uh, and I'm hearing that input uh, from many different quarters in terms of, you know, the cost of, of gas, the, the cost of groceries. Um, it's, it's harder and harder for a, a middle income family uh, to make ends meet. Um, and the inflationary economy um, under this administration is, is, is responsible for that. And so, um, you know, those issues and, and that uh, part of the economy is, is something that I look forward to focusing on, adding my voice of economic know-how, small business acumen, and sense of fiscal responsibility uh, to the equation. As you just mentioned, you and your wife operate a small business. What does Congress need to do to not only incentivize businesses to move to Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. but also to stay and grow and thrive? There's many things that Pennsylvania needs to do um, and at the federal level would be helpful. First among them, I think, is to take um, the uh, different approach on energy policy. Uh, we've had a restrictive energy policy in Pennsylvania now um, under two governors. And the governor that we've got now, Governor Shapiro, just announced that he is kind of doubling down on the uh, regional greenhouse gas initiative under a new name. Uh, but it's essentially a carbon tax program that will restrict uh, energy businesses and especially uh, oil and gas and coal businesses, uh, potentially putting many of those out of business. Um, the coal industry is kind of struggling to, to hang on. But we need this industry in Pennsylvania, not only because we want to keep the lights on, and much of our energy comes from uh, natural gas, oil, and, and the coal industry, uh, but also uh, because it, it creates a lot of jobs and we have a lot of potential for more economic activity uh, in Pennsylvania, especially in the West, if we were to unleash our uh, energy industry to grow jobs, uh, to build uh, more uh, capacity and to export that capacity. Uh, so the governor, I would call on the governor to, um, you know, uh, remediate his plan on, on taxing uh, energy in Pennsylvania uh, to un unleash the energy industry 
and to let it grow uh, more than it has uh, so that we can become competitive again. You know, if you look at a map of where natural gas uh, drilling is happening, you can notice that right along the Pennsylvania border in West Virginia and in Ohio, there's a, a strong cluster of, of new engagement. And the reason for that is because the policies for permitting and for exploration and then for uh, refinement and sale are better in those states. And so the governor has said he wants to beat Ohio um, and I think we know how to do it. We just have to take that action. You know, at the federal level, the problem is that we have cut off all liquid, liquefied natural gas exports, uh, or LNG. And President Biden, through executive order, has cut off those exports. And Pennsylvania is an exporter of liquefied natural gas. And so that directly impacts and hurts uh, those producers of LNG right here in Western PA and across the state. And so that's a policy that, um, that we could take at the federal level to encourage uh, more production in the United States. And the good thing about producing in the United States is that we're the cleanest uh, producers of natural gas um, anywhere in the world. And so from an environmental perspective, it's also very responsible for us to do that production here at home. On your website, you say you'd like to prioritize reducing inflation and making the cost of living affordable. How do you do that? Well, first of all, we need to get our spending back in order. And the way that economics works is that if you overspend through the government, there's more money supply <clears throat> out in the country. And that makes the money that you have at home that you usually spend on gas and groceries less valuable. And it makes the cost of goods and services that much more expensive. And so reducing our spending means balancing the budget, not spending more than we have in the Treasury, and not printing more and more money. That will also help to bring down in, uh, the uh, uh, federal funds rate, which is a direct input into the cost of borrowing for a home or borrowing for a car or to expand a business. And so, you know, that overspending that we all know about in Washington that's hard to rein in, but we can do it, um, is, a, is a direct cause of some of the economic malaise that we have here at home and those uh, inflationary prices. And so, you know, I'm running to be a congressman that watches the budget, that uh, takes action to make sure that we're balanced. Uh, and I would like to see a balanced budget um, over the next few years. We don't want to do it drastically so that, you know, we, we, we cut programs uh, that we care about, but we need to reduce spending over time and get back in balance. On your website, you note that various health care innovations have come out of the Western PA, particularly the That's Pittsburgh right. region. Yeah. As a member of Congress, what would you do to help support and incentivize those innovations to continue to, to grow? There's so many things that we could do. Um, you know, a, a, a large job creator in the West is UPMC. Um, AHN is also, you know, a growing health care network uh, and insurer as well in the Highmark family. These businesses um, are nonprofit. They exist for the good and for the betterment of mankind, and they are doing amazing things with our colleges and universities. And Western PA, in addition to our energy resources, has really become an EDS and MEDS powerhouse. And we need to double down on those um, resources that we have, not only in the energy front, but also in the education and medical um, and healthcare establishment. The innovations coming out of those places are remarkable. And um, you know, one example of, of, of what we need to do is allow these uh, companies to grow and expand um, and to not interfere or intervene when they are trying to, to do so. And the federal government right now is trying to stop mergers and acquisitions in the, um, um, in the, in the healthcare field um, for really no reason um, other to, than to limit the growth. Uh, and it just seems anti-competitive uh, to me. And it also doesn't serve the communities well where some of the smaller hospitals uh, would be um, um, allowed to merge with these larger organizations and then run more efficiently and effectively and for the good of those communities. So I would be an advocate for uh, less regulatory intervention and more encouragement through policies uh, that allow these already successful companies continue to grow, be job creators and influencers in the healthcare space. What would you support to drive down the cost of healthcare and prescription drugs? Well, there's a lot of factors in terms of the cost of those, um, of those elements. And 
prescription benefit managers do a good job today of, of handling that part of the equation. Now, the regulatory oversight um, and some of the cost provisions that are being considered um, to um, at, at, you know, towards the mid-cycle of a, um, a, a new drug's life cycle, where that drug, uh, already profitable to the company that created it, would then uh, be more widely available at a lower cost. What we can't do is punish companies for creating new drugs by forcing them to sell it at a loss or zero profit. That model won't work. And that's kind of the government oversight that I was talking about limiting. We need to incentivize these uh, innovative companies, including drug companies, to come up with the uh, amazing new innovations of, of the future, including new drugs that cure uh, disease. And they should know that if they do that, the market will reward them, not punish them for doing so. And so these prescription benefit managers uh, exist as kind of a go-between between the public, uh, represented by the, the government and their representatives, and these private companies creating uh, these wonderful uh, new innovations. And so again, to limit um, the cost at the right time for those who will benefit so that more people will be able to uh, experience the life-saving drugs, but to not limit uh, the profitability or upside for those companies. And it does take balance, um, and there's a lot of complexity to it. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, those concepts will result in more life-saving drug drugs. You know, companies uh, in that drug space being able to grow and expand and create new jobs for our region. Um, but the right kind of regulatory balance where then those uh, drugs will be affordable for more people. What are your views on abortion and access to IVF? Well, IVF is something um, that I think uh, creates uh, opportunities for families um, all across the country, and we should not limit the ability of families um, to use that um, uh, treatment. And, you know, I'm pro-family, and I do want to see um, as many families um, grow and succeed into a thriving family environment as, as possible. In Pennsylvania, uh, we have uh, an abortion control law at 23 weeks with appropriate exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother, and I support those exceptions. Um, as a pro-life person, I believe that every life matters and that we need to protect life, um, but I do think it's a state issue, and I think that a federal ban is not appropriate. And uh, so as a congressman, you know, that's where I stand. What specific policies would you support to reduce gun violence? Well, actually, uh, you know, this week we're talking a lot about uh, the Second Amendment and, um, and, and gun control. And there are advocates on both sides of the issue. Um, and I would say that our community safety is, is paramount to me, that I want our school children to feel safe, those who go to church and congregate and, and go to uh, stadium environments should be able to feel safe. And our Constitution is also something that is sacred. I took an oath to defend the Constitution both as a uh, second lieutenant in the Army and uh, as a state legislator twice. And so I take those obligations seriously. Our Second Amendment rights are pretty clear in both the U.S. and state constitutions. And I believe that we should uh, certainly not infringe on that right in Pennsylvania or in the United States. Um, I did support recently a background check expansion uh, to make sure that those who are buying firearms uh, are properly cleared. And I think that that's a common sense approach where we balance our Second Amendment rights to purchase and own firearms with uh, the ability of our communities to feel safe and for law enforcement to know that those who have firearms uh, have been properly cleared. Would you support any changes to our immigration policy or perhaps how that policy is being enforced? Absolutely. Um, our immigration system is broken. Uh, we need uh, strong reforms in this area, including closing our southern border. Um, anybody who comes into our country from another country um, should come law, uh, lawfully and with the appropriate uh, clearances. And if we don't have that, uh, we have broken down the system in a bad way. And unfortunately, on day one, President Biden stopped the building of the border fence and uh, created a situation where 
money that had already been allocated to the completion of a border fence uh, was wasted. And I was down at the border a few months ago uh, to uh, witness what's going on down there in Arizona. And I saw the border fence that had already been paid for with taxpayer dollars, where while, while there's a large gap miles long in, in the fence, and many people coming over illegally um, through, the, through the gap. Um, and what happens is, as we know now, is that the nefarious activities um, on, the, on the journey up to the border um, are, are terrible. Uh, inhumane conditions, um, using and abusing migrants who um, have no means to protect themselves on that illegal crossing. And so it's a humanitarian disaster. The way to mitigate that is to honor the law, close the border, which, which will stop that illegal trafficking, and make our legal process for newcomers into the country a lot more robust uh, to allow for the proper legal immigration so that we have the workforce that we need. Um, I mean, my family came over from Italy on my dad's side um, and, uh, and from Ireland and England on my mom's side, and they were immigrants once too. And so I understand the need uh, for uh, folks to come to the United States, but it just has to be through the legal process. You've said that you support a parental bill of rights in education. Can you give me some specifics as to what you'd like that to look like? Yeah, so as a dad of three kids, uh, I completely understand the, the, the primacy of parents' involvement in their students' education. And uh, we've been involved from day one with our kids um, as elementary school students. And we've always had a nice working relationship with our wonderful teachers um, at our school. And to me, the issue comes down to making sure that as students grow in their abilities and as curriculum gets more and more complex, as the students get kind of life ready uh, towards their graduation from high school, that parents are uh, involved at every step. And so as topics get complex and um, as uh, students get interested in, in those topics and as the curriculum demands uh, complex conversations, parents should be notified and brought along with those students. And I think that is a really, really important uh, aspect of education. So, you know, declaring a parent's bill of rights, um, e either in the state legislature, which I support, or in the U.S. Congress, which, which I also would support, um, is, is absolutely essential given the number of difficult topics that our public schools are encountering. And, uh, and that would take a lot of the issues out of uh, the equation because parents could opt in or opt out of what their students are learning. What would you support to make higher education more affordable? So higher education is um, it kind of run away out of control from a cost standpoint. It's be, become unaffordable to many people. Um, and we need structural reform, uh, meaning that a lot of the state funded uh, institutions, we need to relook. The governor has called for a blueprint where he would, uh, he's called for the combining of, of some parts of, of the state programs and for a, uh, a more a, a accountable performance-based system to be in place and uh, for uh, cost to be brought down. And that'll take investment from the state, but it also will take uh, creativity um, and bipartisanship from the legislature. And I, what I don't think is appropriate is for President Biden to force feed this um, loan forgiveness that's unpredictable and uh, you know legally questionable and uh, that doesn't reward kind of a set of uh, uh, expected outcomes, meaning that parents and students should look at educational options uh, for higher education. We're doing that right now with our oldest and make decisions based on their own finances what's available in terms of state aid uh, or scholarships. And then once they chart that path and enter into the education, know that they're accountable and responsible for paying that back over time. What we know about student loans is that you know, they will um, adjust if, if need be. If you talk to your education counselor where you don't have to pay while you're in school and that you can pay over time when you get out according to the jobs that you have. 
Um, and so I'm for that responsibility of the student and the families uh, to make those pay payments. There's also a responsibility of the schools that uh, they need to watch costs and they should not feel uh, that it's uh, okay for them to just continue to increase tuition year over year. And they also should feel accountable to providing an opportunity for a good return on the dollars that are spent by students and families and taxpayers. Um, and if they're not seeing that return on investment, then they might have to make adjustments to the programs so that they're uh, more appropriate for the workforce needs of our, uh, of our students. Um, and so there's a lot of change that needs to be made. Some of it is structural, um, and some of it is uh, related to the accountability between the schools and the families. Um, and I sit on the education committee at the state, um, and uh, you know, as a congressman, I would certainly oppose uh, additional unpredictable um, loan repayments uh, from the president. Before we run out of time, I'd like to give you an opportunity to tell our viewers one more time why you would like them to elect you to be the Republican nominee for the 17th Congressional District. Well, again, thank you so much for having me today. It's been a pleasure to be your guest today. Um, you know, I would just say to all the voters out there uh, that it's an honor for me to represent uh, Pennsylvania now in the state legislature and that as a congressman, I will fight hard every single day uh, to make uh, Pennsylvania more competitive to improve the lives of our people and families in the region um, and to get uh, the United States back on track uh, so that we can uh, rekindle the American dream for every single person. Thank you. Rob McCurry, 17th Congressional District, running for the Republican nomination. Thank you for joining us.